do uh, feel free to take a seat if you're here in the building, or maybe I should say take a patch of carpet. And uh, it's great to have you with us as well um, right now online. I wonder what you're hoping for this Christmas. I'm one of a large family, so I have uh, four brothers and sisters. My wife Beth has four brothers and sisters. We have about a million cousins. So Christmas for us is like normally a crazy mix of kids and presents and the occasional argument and then lots of fun. Uh, But the last couple of years, lots of those connections have been frustrated. They haven't quite happened. And so this year we're looking for kind of restored connection because connections create joy. And I think lots of us would feel we don't want to miss the moment this year. We don't want to miss the connection. In life, it's so important not to miss the moment or miss the connection. A friend of mine was interviewing uh, for his company, and he has a corner office, and the door to his corner office is in the corner of his corner office, and uh, it's quite a difficult door to open, and so he has to kind of open it like this and out like that. And one of the candidates knocked on the door, and so he went to open the door, and opened it like this, and the interviewer, interviewee looked at him and thought, this guy wants to give me a hug. Like, I've just turned up for an interview, why is he, why is he giving me a hug? And he thought, well, maybe, it, maybe it's a really friendly company, I don't want to appear unfriendly, so I should probably go with the flow. So he kind of like opened his arms up to, to receive the hug, and my friend was like, this candidate wants to hug me. Like, I, in all the interviews I've done, no candidate has ever offered to hug me before, but I don't want to appear like we're an unfriendly company, so I guess I should reciprocate. So he kind of went like this, and they moved towards each other, arms out like this, and when they're about a foot away from each other, their eyes met, and they suddenly realized, no one wants a hug. Like, but by that stage, it was too late, momentum was established, and so they had the most awkward three-second hug you could possibly imagine, sat down, didn't mention it for the rest of the interview, and at the end of the interview, had a very firm handshake, and then left, and actually, he did employ him, and they laugh about it now. But it's so important not to miss the connection. So often, connections can be misunderstood or frustrated, but connections create joy. I wonder what you hope for this year. I think lots of us, deep down, hope for joy. Maybe you're still wearing, bearing some of the bruises of the last few years, wearing some of the scars. Maybe you're hoping for joy this year. Joy is a fascinating thing. It's different from happiness. Happiness is based on what happens to us. If we're up, we're up. If we're down, we're down. But joy is different. It's stronger. It comes from a different place. You can have everything going wonderfully in your life. Your job can be amazing, you met someone you think is great, and yet you can still feel that something's missing. You can still deep down be searching for joy. Everything can be a disaster in your life. You could have had a really tough time at work, you could have broken up with someone, and yet deep down you can still feel joy. This year there's been lots of wonderful things uh, that I've experienced, lots of great things, but there have also been some tough things, some things that have been quite hard and confusing to go through, some things I wouldn't have wished on anyone else. But in the midst of them, I've known joy, a confidence that there's a purpose to life, a trust that I'm not on my own in this universe, the peace and the hope that comes from having joy. Maybe you've had a tough time at work. Maybe you're longing to meet someone you haven't yet. And you would say, this Christmas, I would long for joy. Maybe you've had a great year and everything's going brilliantly. But deep down, you'd say, there's something missing. I'm longing for joy. And sometimes when we look at the Christmas story, we can think, well, that can't possibly relate to me. Because my life is complex. It's tricky. You know, maybe you've got a difficult boss. Maybe you are a difficult boss. <laughs> and you look at the Christmas nativity story and it looks a little bit too neat, a little bit too tidy. Lots of kind of holy, sorted, great people huddled around this little crib with a baby. And you think, what's that got to do with my life? But actually, it's much more messy than that. You've got Joseph there facing all the challenges of trying to support his fiance as she gets ready to give birth to a baby which isn't his. All the confusion, some of the shame and questioning of that, trusting, hoping that this baby will bring joy. Mary, you know, young, vulnerable, after a long journey, giving birth, 
to her first baby when she's not yet married in a culture in which everyone would have had an opinion about that. Everyone would have had an opinion about her hoping, trusting that this baby will bring great joy. And then the shepherds just like turning up randomly. I mean, it's like the last thing you want in a delivery unit. You know, suddenly like, like randoms coming saying, hi, we've never met before. We just thought we'd hang out. No, <laughs> don't come anywhere near us. But they just roll in. Hi, we're so excited. And it must have been awkward for them trying to work out why out of all the people on the face of the globe, they were summoned to the birth of the one who came to save the globe. Hoping, trusting that this might even be good news for them. See, it's much more messy. It's much more complex. It's why I love uh, nativity plays in schools. They're often a little bit closer to the original because I don't know if you've noticed, but they don't always work out quite the way they're planned. Sometimes things go a little bit wrong. They're a little bit messy, a little bit complicated. One of my friends went to a nativity play and he was sitting there watching it and you had the crib on stage, you had little boy playing Joseph, little girl playing Mary and the crib with the baby Jesus in front of them and uh, you know, smiling sweetly. And then the shepherds came out, this kind of group of shepherds, and uh, the lead shepherd came over and he kind of looked down at the crib, said, it's a nice baby. <laughs> and Mary said, thank you. He said, what are you going to call him? And Mary was like, Colin? (laughs) And the shepherd said, Colin? Colin Christ? That's a a stupid name. And then Mary burst into tears. And her brother, who was acting as one of the wise men, came running over and pushed the shepherd over in defense of her. And then the other shepherds attacked the wise men. You had a religious war on the stage of the school nativity. That's much closer to the original. It's messy. It's complicated. And in the most vulnerable act in the history of the cosmos, God comes to us as a baby in the mess, in the complexity, because he wants to come close to us. His name was Jesus. God who saves. Jesus came to save. If our greatest need was a military victory, God would have sent a general. If our greatest need was entertainment, he would have sent an actor. If our greatest need was a reassurance, things are going to be okay and we're on the upward path and there's no need to worry about anything, he would have sent a politician. If our greatest need was money, he would have sent a banker. But our greatest need was forgiveness and the joy that comes from knowing the breathless wonder of forgiveness. And so he sent a saviour. And I need saving. I need a rescuer. I make mistakes. Even when I'm trying to do the right thing sometimes, I mess up. I'm very aware of my own failings. I still remember I I worked as a a, a criminal barrister for a number of years. Over the years, I represented hundreds, probably over a thousand people accused of crimes. It's great that some of you have come out tonight. And uh, (laughs) I... In my first week, at the end of my first week, I was sent off to court to um, try and get someone bail. And I only had the name of the client. I rushed off to court and I met the client in the cells. And I, it was very difficult circumstances, difficult offence. He'd got lots of previous convictions. He wasn't likely to get bail. And I tried to explain this to him. And within about 20 seconds, I realised he knew far more about the criminal justice system than I did or was ever likely to know. And he said, look, you know, do what you can. And I went upstairs and outside court, there was all his mates and some of his family were outside. And one of his mates stepped forward, to this day, probably the biggest person I've ever seen in real life. And he said, are you going to get him bail? And I said, well, I'll, I'll try. I'll try and get him bail. But it's difficult because of all these circumstances. You know, I'll try. And he said, you really want to get him bail. And I, I'm going to try and get him <laughs> bail. And then he said, would it help if I gave you some money? And I said, what? Like, oh, as a surety for the court? Yeah, that would, that would help. I mean, how much, how much do you have? And he said, would 50,000 pounds help? I was like, that's a lot of money, but okay. And then another friend stepped forward and said, no, are you new at this? He said, never offer 50. If you offer 50, they'll think we're right criminals. 
just offer five. I was like, okay, I'll offer five. I'm getting trained in my first week at work, you know, by these guys outside court. So I went into court. Everyone was there. The judge came in. I did my best to persuade her to grant him jail. She wasn't having, grant him bail. There wasn't having any of it. And as she refused him bail, my client shrugged his shoulders, elbowed the security guards either side of him and ran out of the courtroom. And all his mates ran in and started fighting the security officers. Alarms went off. Police started piling through the courtroom. I was thinking, you know, I was a bit disappointed because I thought, you know, I'd hope to make an impact in my first week at work and he'd been refused bail. Then I looked around and thought, this is going to make an impact, you know. <laughs> and um, they're all rushing out of the court and I, I saw his friend dragged back through the court. Another person be arrested. They couldn't find him. I walked out of the courtroom and I was thinking, this is a disaster. There were like police outside the court. I went back to my office. I walked in and I thought, this is, this is so, this is probably the worst day everyone's, anyone's ever had. And trying to encourage me, a senior guy came up to me and said, Stephen, how did it go? Did he get out? I was like, <laughs> maybe, I don't know. Some others went in, but I'm not really sure. I... And I went home that night and I tell you, I felt like such a failure. I was so aware of my shortcoming. And my father-in-law was staying with us that night. And he said something to me that I've never forgotten. He said, Stephen, when I employ someone, what I'm doing is I'm buying their failures. I'm buying their mistakes. I'm taking that on because I want that experience. And it's really struck me a number of times since that what Jesus has done for us on the cross is he's bought our failures. He's bought our mistakes. He's paid the price for our failure, took the punishment we deserve so that we might experience the peace and the joy that is his birthright. That relationship with God, that connection with God. Jesus doesn't just pretend it's all okay. He enters into the mess and the complexity of life. He knows that we've fallen short and he wants to make a way through it to win us joy. I was listening this week to uh, Stormzy's latest album, it's an amazing album. It's like a work of art. It's an awesome album. And uh, I wouldn't quote all the tracks right here now. Um, there's some great tracks on it. But there was one track. I mean, Storm has Storm's had unparalleled success, as you know, huge influence, is recreating the music industry, opening up opportunities for a whole generation of young people. And then there's this lyric he writes in one of his tracks. Isn't it amazing that faith is all we needed to find the missing pieces. Oh, I've been searching for my Jesus. There's times when I felt worthless. You give me peace and purpose, although I don't deserve it, although I'm far from perfect. It's a joy. It's the feeling you give, Lord. You filled me with bliss. It's a feeling I don't want to resist, Lord. What gives you joy? Purpose, connection. In an encounter with Jesus, you experience the joy of meeting the person who fought you up and has made you for a purpose and wants you to live a life of joy. You might think that you're searching for Jesus, but Jesus is searching for you. And at Christmas, you can know he has come close. He's made himself a baby. But he was also willing to pay any price, bear any cost, in order to win you a relationship with God. Joy isn't an achievement, it's a gift. Joy isn't something you earn, it's a gift you receive. And right now, in a relationship with Jesus, you can experience joy and joy in all its fullness. It's not an accident you're here tonight, it might feel like that. There's a purpose to your presence here. And the one who knew you before any of your days came to be is drawing close to you tonight. Don't miss the connection because connection creates joy. It's the most vulnerable act in the history of the cosmos. Why? To get close to you, to connect with you, 
so that you might know good news of great joy. Amen.